to our partners, Colmont. So, um, yeah, a big welcome to, to Benoit, who will chat to us uh, just now, who's in the, in the screen there. Hopefully you can see him. And then obviously JP and, and, and Paul, uh, who settled into a, a magnum of rosé all the way in Franschhoek. So, um, fantastic to have everyone. Um, for those of you that haven't joined, just a, a few things just to obviously add as much value as we can uh, in terms of probably the agenda and the functionality. Uh, most of you have probably been using Zoom quite a lot since, since lockdown. Uh, so we obviously encourage the, the functionality of, of, of the chat room, which is at the bottom there. Um, just click on chat and, and throughout the, the tasting, if you want to put some comments, uh, let us know what you're drinking or let us know what questions you might have, and then I'll obviously pose them to, to Benoit and, and Paul as and when. Um, for those of you that don't know, these tasters are recorded, so it is something that you, we can access later and send to you later. Um, and then just from a video point of view, everyone's videos and the audios will be turned off, uh, just for certainly the large part of the, the tasters. And then at the end, we, we're more than happy to, to rope some of you in, those of you that want to come up on video and ask some questions. I know that we've, we've lined up one of, uh, one of the top South African bubbly makers who's going to come on at the end and engage with us, old Peter Ferreira. I'm sure all of you know him. So hopefully he sticks with us until the end and, uh, and then we'll, have, we'll engage with him there. So yeah, Benoit is one of our, again, one of our great friends. We've, we've worked with uh, Margay Champagnes for many, many years, one of our first producers that, uh, for, there we go, 20, well, 20 years, Benoit. So one of our producers that we've worked with for a very long time, and lots has changed in the years that we've worked with Benoit in terms of uh, the developments, positive, all of them that have happened at the domain. And uh, we've watched with, um, yeah, with great interest in terms of all the positive developments that have happened. So. It's a huge privilege and an honor to, to represent your wines in South Africa. And you're always quick with a joke, and uh, we, we love that. It's, uh, the, the interaction and the relationship is obviously very important. So just lastly, and before I hand over to Benoit, um, we're looking to do sort of an hour again. That's sort of the broad time span. Uh, Benoit's just going to start with a very quick overview of Champagne, a very, very short um, uh, sort of summary of how champagne's made. We do have a variety of uh, guests that are on this, so we just want to quickly cover that. A quick overview of champagne, and then we'll get into um, a bit of a discussion on grower champagnes versus the Grand Marks, and then obviously Champagne Margay as a whole. And then we'll hand over to, to Paul, and I'm sure JP might chip in, in terms of going into what Colmont's achieved and what they've done over the years. And then obviously we'll do our best to keep it as interactive as possible, so please feel free to pop your questions in on the chat and I'll um, raise the hand and interrupt the guys as and when is appropriate. So um, enjoy it. And um, thanks everyone for, for joining us. I'm going to hand over to Benoit. Thanks Benoit. Thanks to you. I'm happy to be with you tonight. Uh, so uh, here we are in Champagne. Uh, it's a special season for us to start. It's very hot. We are still like summertime now. Um, just a little brief explanation of our view about the region. We are located uh, northeast of Paris, so that's between, uh, if you wish, Belgium, Luxembourg, and Paris. Uh, the main city is called Reims, or Reims in French. And myself, I'm, I, I'm located in a small village called Angonnet, which is 25 kilometers south of the main city, Greece. Um, the altitude where I am standing now is something like 100 meters above sea level, and uh, the maximum altitude of the vineyard will be something around 200 meters. So below 100, we get frost every year, so you get to grow your grapes with COVID, and, um, and that's mostly the case in the other. The appellation represents about 35,000 hectares, which is quite small in the world of hot and wine. I think we, Champagne is less than 9% of the tiny. Uh, 35,000 hectares spread it into, uh, into this region with different um, soils. 
different exposures. And, and of course, some will be better for Chardonnay, some will be better for Quinoa, and the first right variety is Pinot Noir. Um, I'm the sixth generation to work on the estate, so we start... Pinot uh, Yeah. Pinot Noir, just, sorry, do you mind if I just interrupt quickly? Um, there's a few people that just, um, the, the sound seems a bit, uh, a bit low. I don't know if it might be better without the headphones. And uh, if you can maybe just try and just see if that'll make a difference. Okay, can you hear me better? That, that's, def that's definitely a bit better. Okay. Maybe we'll just try. I might interrupt you again, but carry on. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay, uh, sorry. So, so I was saying that I was living in a beautiful, charming village called Ambrenay. Uh, we are south of Reims. So if you look on the map, there is this green hill side called the Montagne de Reims, the Reims mountain, but still it, it goes up to 300 meters above sea level, so that's not a big deal. And at the bottom part of it, you can see Ambrenay Bouzy, and so we are south facing, uh, as the, the, the north is on the, the, the upper part and the, the right part of the, of the screen. Um, so um, if you go further down, you have a pale green color. This is called the Côte des Blancs, the white coast, as opposed to where I am from, which is called the black coast also. Uh, that means that in my region, we mostly grow Pinot Noir, and in the white coast, people mostly grow Chardonnay. There's a third main region called the Marne Valley, which is the western side of the Champagne, um, getting uh, maybe 100 kilometers from Paris, and uh, this is mostly planted with Pinot Meunier, the third grape variety allowed. And this grape variety is also a, a black skin uh, with uh, white tubes. So to, to, to understand, we, we are making mostly a white wine. I mean, 90% um, of champagne is doing white champagne and 10% will be rosé. And so all these wines are made with, as a whole, 38% Pinot Noir, 32% Pinot Meunier, so that's a minimum of 70% of black skin grape, and then the rest is Chardonnay, 30%. So how come we can end up with a, 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 a no-colored wine uh, champagne? Uh, well, uh, simply um, because the, the pressing will be very gentle, it will uh, happen in a long time, very slowly, in order to extract just the juice from the breaking cell of the berry and um, without getting the taint, without getting the color from the skin. If you go very slowly, just the juice is coming out, no maceration of course, you don't get the skin fade, and uh, this is our champagne. Uh, And, um, and so most of the region um, is, uh, is driven by, uh, by a small farmer. You have um, 3,000 people like me. Um, some go further and uh, do their own champagne. Most sell their grapes to co-op, uh, famous one is called Nicolas. And uh, the other people sell their grapes to Negociant, uh, which uh, are the main uh, producers of Champagne because they, they represent something like 80% of the sales. So you have uh, LVMH Group, you have the Great House of Paul Roger, you have uh, Bollinger, and so on. Um, and obviously, uh, these brands are purchasing of cultivating grapes from the whole region, while on my own, I'm rather concentrated on my uh, two uh, family historic villages, 
which are Ambonet and Guzi in the mountains of the France. Uh, that is Telka in the world, which we found um, uh, of Genki and Biodinian tree. Uh, two hectares are sold to a negociant, that's a family wish. So uh, the negociant is a called Krug. And uh, I also buy a little bit of grapes from friends uh, in other Krug, in other villages. These grapes are exclusively organic or biodynamic certified. And the purpose of purchasing from them is to be able to release champagne from other terroirs than mine, so from other soils. And it's really, really uh, interesting when you are passionate to, to be able to release a single origin, another origin, uh, and maybe 20 kilometers away, uh, different slide, different origin of champagne, a little bit of Burgundy, like Burgundy. And in that way, uh, what we're doing is kind of a revolution in, in the Champagne region where historically, uh, we, People focus on um, on on, uh, on taste from the from the name. People focus on blending. People focus on um, on, on hiding the origin somewhere. Uh, on my side, I put it was really there and right to to develop uh, champagne uh, without being German or Mrs. And so you can see that. Uh, I'm not talking too much. I can see the sparkling wine production uh, graph. And so we have uh, the cuvee, which is uh, the, the juice coming from the press. Uh, that's me with the horse in the vineyard. Uh, but if we come back to the one before, uh, we'll see that uh, after the cuvee, uh, the, the fermentation in barrels or in tanks, and fermentation in barrels with maybe 10% in Champagne, and most of the wine are fermented in stainless steel. Then starts the tirage of the bottling, which is most of the time in the springtime. The tirage marquee will wait longer, so we will do it in uh, late June, mid July. Uh, then we go for the aging. Aging is this is down in the case, uh, so below my uh, my foot, uh, 10 meters below me, uh, you have a 250,000 bottle of aging at a constant temperature of 12 Celsius degrees. You see the, uh, the thickness of the bubbles that is captured in this low temperature, and uh, the, the second fermentation is developing slowly. It's also then a, a period of maturation, a period of maturity, when uh, we call it, uh, we call it actually uh, autolysis. Autolysis means the self-destruction of the yeast, and the yeast who were in charge of doing the second fermentation in the bottle are going step by step, month after month, they are going to decompose and uh, we eat, if you wish, some proteins into the wine, some amino acid. It's a fabulous alchemy going on. And um, once the aging is, is, is considered to be, to be done, so that's a minimum of uh, 15 months in Champagne. Uh, at Marguerite, it's a minimum of two years. Once it's over, um, we Happens the breathing, which you can see the, the next step. Breathing means um, turning step by step the bottle from the laying position to the upside down position. So you uh, bring the, the sediments, the leaves, the yeast, you bring them to the neck of the bottle. So at the end of it, of course, it's done by machine today, but in the past we used to do it by hand. But at the end of this uh, this thing, uh, this step, we we, we have uh, the bottle upside down, 
and we are going to do the disgorgement of disgorging, which means just the neck of the bottle will be frozen, and this will uh, uh, hold the yeast. Um, then we can, um, if you wish, open up the bottle very quickly, and so with the pressure inside the bottle, something like um, 6 bar, 90 psi, with the pressure, the yeast will be exposed, and uh, the ice as well, and the wine will, uh, the champagne will remain inside the bottle, very clear, and at, uh, at that time, so the bottle is reopened, which is uh, not something that is, uh, I would say, normal to happen, because we when you bottle the wine, you know, it's only the customer who, who reopen the bottle. But in Champagne, and for a fine method of the sparkling wine, we get rid of the, of the sediments by reopening the bottle. And possibly you can add, after, uh, at least at the same time, you can add a, a liqueur called a liqueur of disgorgement, which is based, uh, which is a sugar action. And, um, and here we will go with a different style. So a uh, switch champagne will be called uh, Dou. As you can see at the bottom of the, of the slide, on the right side, uh, Dou, the mid sec. These are with uh, the corresponding amount of sugar. And Brut is the main quality, the main style. So from zero to 12 grams of sugar. Uh, and Personally, at Champagne Marguerite, we only use Brut Nature, so that means zero sugar in the, in the Champagne. Next slide, uh, thank you, Christine, is about uh, uh, the winter time. Here we are uh, simply putting uh, adding compost in the vineyard. So it's pretty cold, our region is supposed to be very cold. Uh, it's less and less the case with global warming, but We'll see, uh, you never know. Um, I, I'd like to, to point out that um, in 1600, there was a period of time of something like uh, 40 years where it was nearly tropical in our region. So there's no doubt that we, uh, the, the, the planet is, is, is overpolluted by, by humans. That's, there's no question about it, but for sure, there's something uh, also, uh, uh, there's a matter of cycle, and we can see uh, it happen in the past as well. But probably in one. Yeah. In one, just a, a quick interruption on the, the temperature, which I think is really interesting. And if I'm not mistaken, and I remember correctly, Champagne has increased by half a degree um, every decade for the last 30 years. And, and that's a big increase in terms of average temperature. Uh, and for you as a, as a grower, is, is that sort of, sort of obvious uh, scientific um, information in terms of temperature? Is that making things easier or, or more difficult for you in Champagne in terms of having grapes that are obviously uh, growing in a, in a climate that is increasing? What, how, how, what's your take on that? Not a problem at all for me, not at all. Um, possibly we will have more body style champagne, so that means people should stop using uh, sugar at the disgorgement because they get enough, I would say, counterbalance to the acidity, to the minerality. Um, but this is not even obvious. What's happening is that we are um, harvesting earlier than before. Uh, to give you an idea, my grandpa most of the time ended his uh, harvest around 10th of October, and it was like 10 days of picking. My father, most of the time, my parents, most of the time, uh, started around the 20th, 25th of September, a little bit earlier. And me, since 2003, I picked the grapes four times in August around 20 or 40 years, and this year is going to be the fifth year. I only picked once in October, that was in 2013. So that means uh, that as a whole, the period 
of between the bud breaking to the maturation to the harvest is shorter than, than before. So, phenolically speaking, that means in terms of maturity of the peeps, maturity of the skins, it's different from before, where this time was younger. But um, looking at the at the pH of the wine, looking at the acidity, looking at the uh, the balance, um, I, I am not worrying at all. I'm not worrying at all. Um, it's just that we 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 have to be working more earlier in the season. And one of the other problems of uh, of uh, of the uh, wine is uh, possibly the breaking that happened before, and uh, that's a problem because we may not have strong winter anymore. They are very mild, uh, but the spring may be uh, very cold, and this is uh, till uh, mid May. Mid till mid May, we can already have frost, and we may get heat this year. So it was close. So um, as a whole, for my own global warming is, is a better thing uh, because uh, it's, it's possibly easier in the vineyard. But uh, this year, you can see it's very sunny. Uh, last year was the same. 18 was the same, but 17 and 16 were really tough. 12 and 13 were really tough. So we are having like a couple of years in a row that are easy and a few that are not easy with heavy showers. And that's kind of uh, reminding us uh, that uh, the power is from the nature. So on this picture, um, you can see uh, different plants we're using to accompany uh, the vineyard against the disease. There are two main diseases in Champagne, mildew and the other one, the mildew which is for potato, for tomato and vineyard. And the other one is called powdery mildew, which is giving white leaves like on the roses. And, um, and so this year is more sensible to powdery mildew for me. And uh, on, this, uh, on these features, you can see plants. We will be using different size kind of plants uh, in order to rise uh, the self-defense of the vineyard, to rise the autoimmune system of the vineyard. And each of these has uh, its own um, uh, benefits. So you can see some garlic on the table, you can see some um, achillea on the table, you can see some sage, and this will be very positive against powder in it. And on the left picture, so I'm sorry, I don't know all the names in English, but there is some uh, prel. Prel is horse tail. Uh, I don't guess you, I don't think you get a lot of this going in South Africa. And then you have some bark, bark of local plants, Camomilla on top as well, and this will be very interesting against the uh, mildew. We are not looking at um, killing, killing a mushroom, killing a fungus, killing a disease. We are looking at a balance. We are looking at uh, harmony. So if there is a little, a little development of something, it could be an insect or so, it's fine. There is room for everyone on the planet. And if we want to survive, we have to keep to hold with this. But uh, we just don't want this to come over, to develop too strong. So um, we, 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 we believe that the plant has a fantastic power, and uh, there are lots of things in nature that can help us. And, uh, so Benoit, that's, uh, that's, that's fascinating to see what's, what's happening on the soil front. And I can see Paul there, uh, sipping on his rosé, and I know Paul's going to chat a bit later, but it, I'll, I'm just interested from a soil point of view, Paul, just hearing uh, a bit about what um, what Ben was doing, what, what what is sort of um, what, what's happening on the in the sort of Colmon soils in terms of how you guys are treating the soils, um, 
maybe not adding garlic and things like that, Benoit. Um, but no, I'm interested to know sort of the, the differences. Yeah, um, Derek, this sounds okay. You can hear me? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Yeah, Derek, yeah, um, definitely this, even from our, our bigger producers that are um, providing special blocks for us or portions of blocks for us, um, there's a big move away from chemicals at the moment. Not, um, not quite exactly what uh, Benoit is doing, but um, we, we spend a lot of time picking sites. And, and one of the things I'd love like from Benoit is, is this idea of um, the top soils in Champagne on top of the chalk. I know, for example, the Crayere in and Le, I think Le Belmont um, are, are two sites of Chardonnay that I'm really interested in hearing about the topsoil. And it's something that we at Kumar spend a lot of time looking at, at different soils with different clones. You know, so, for example, something in Robertson with uh, a nice, you know, kind of, there's a certain amount of chalk in the soil, then moving across, um, I think uh, Christine will show it later, with the shell in Bonnyville, and this kind of nice tight flintiness that's coming from the shell. So. When, when we're picking sites for ourselves at Kumar, we are looking at these, the kind of the diversity of soil types. And then there's a strong movement back to, to having less interference in the soil. So, you know, in some cases in, in Bonneville this year, um, doing no spraying at all in, 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 on, on the kind of cover crop side or, or, or managing the, the shoulders of the vineyard. And we, we see fantastic results from, from sites like that and then picking sites like that. Um, and it's one of the things that I, I kind of saw in Champagne and always fascinated me in Champagne was this attention to detail on the different top soils and, and, and the soils. And, yeah. uh, I think, thank, thanks, Paul. Is that, what's that, Benoit? Hard to see, but uh, this is Lake Crayer. So the bottom part is the chalk and the top. And then we have a light colored um, clay and limestone, and darker parts on top. So it's a very uh, thin soil, and very quickly you end up on the model rock. So that would be uh, for Pinot Noir and mostly Chardonnay. And uh, that's this kind of thing as well. But that's uh, a different thing. Uh, I call it upper in the, on the hill with clay, which is very red. And uh, the chalk is slightly different, deeper, around one meter. So all these will uh, on the on the, um, the harvest and grapes together with the microclimate mix because the village and living in has um, many different climates especially and many different soils people would expect to have the same similar thing that is very different from one location to another. Uh, thanks, Benoit. I'm, uh, I'm just seeing the next slide is obviously into the cellar and just on that, the last point on the soil, I think it's, it's fascinating to see what you're doing in the soils because I think everyone that has been fortunate enough to be, uh, to have visited Champagne knows the history about how the soils weren't treated very well in the past. And it almost seems the direct opposite where you are you feeding them something that I might be happy to eat for supper that you're feeding to the vine. So um, it's, a, it's an interesting concept to see what you're doing. Um, Benoit, in the cellar, um, I know you're going to go through a bit of about what you do in the cellar. And before we, we started the presentation, I showed you that I'm drink, we're drinking the 2012 uh, Le Crayer. And I always get... Um, interested and excited when you turn the bottle around and you see a dosage of zero and sulfites of zero. Um, and I think that's one of the, the really interesting parts about your, your method and your champagne that you end up putting in the bottle where it's the most sort of naked version of um, what you're producing from your vineyard. So it'll be, you know, it'll be great to hear what's, what goes on in the cellar and, uh, and a bit about the, the dosage and the reasoning behind it. 
Okay, it's a new interpretation of champagne because when I grew up, when I went at school at the university, people said to me, it's impossible to do it. You must use a sulfide, you must use sugar. Those two are important for the potential of aging on the wine. Uh, but this was at a time when the vineyards were treated in one way. Um, I give as much respect, consideration to you guys as I would give, as well, I mean to human, as I would give to uh, my wine in the barrel, to my vineyard, to my soil, to my soil. That means that most of the people are pretending that the wine is alive, which is right. But people don't realize how living it is. So any any behaving, whether it is in your intention or in in, uh, in the acting, is very important. And the wine inside the barrel or the vine inside the terroir is able to to to, to, to get to feel your love. Is able to feel your um, your commitment uh, for it, and so when you when you see that uh, one tradition is going towards an end, one tradition is um, is not harmonious. Um, you change at the beginning. Neighbors, they they think you are crazy. They look at you. They look at you, they, are, they think you are stupid. And, and step by step, people change their mind because they see some results. They see the leads are not the same. They see uh, it's, it's uh, living in the soil. They, they can see the worms coming back. And it's, uh, it's very interesting because uh, you can catch up people together with you. And uh, when it comes to wine, uh, the energy of the wine is not showing the same as 20 years back. Um, and so at one time, you, you smell, uh, you smell uh, sulfite, you, you feel uh, sugar is not right, and you say, well, I should, I should, I should go another way. I should um, maybe decrease the, the amount of each. And, and the whole family goes for it. It's not just one champagne. I can propose this way. It's uh, one, and then the other ones follow. Uh, it's like the family of champagne I'm making was asking for the same treat as one of them, and um, it was it was fabulous. All these changes happened uh, in 2011, 2012, and, and and we developed this way. And in the more recent years, like since 2016, 2017, we felt like a change. We felt like a change not about the sugar, but about the sulfide. And um, you know, we have this virus today on the planet. Wherever it's, it's coming from, whether, wherever it's, um, if, if it's a lab who made it, or if it's a natural origin, what, wherever it comes from, um, it has some kind of a reason to be, to offer us a, a new, a new uh, view on the planet, to offer us a new lecture, a new interpretation of how, how to live on this planet. But this virus is very strong. And uh, uh, of course, um, this is not the only thing that is affected by the, the change the climate change and the pollution. So back in the 50s, there was already something going on. There was a bacteria happening in the wine of Champagne. These bacteria happened everywhere else in the world. It's called malolactic bacteria and was responsible of a new fermentation. Positive, yes, fine. But before the 50s, this bacteria was not existing. So today, um, as a whole, in Europe, not only in Champagne, in Switzerland, in Germany, in South of France, we see that the yeast have more and more problems to ferment, unfortunately. They, 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 they lack power, and so uh, sadly, um, we are 
using a little bit some uh, some sulfide today in the more recent wines, not for a reason of protection of the wines, but for a reason of uh, avoiding some wrong yeast to develop. So what I want to say is that uh, we 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 are not. Uh, you know, uh, tight on, on one way of working. Uh, we do the best we can. We adapt to every season and we adapt to the living side of it that is evolving. The, 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 the next part is that we, we develop our own yeast with the lab. So we isolate some yeast uh, from our vineyard to avoid the, the use of uh, selected yeast, I would say. And we choose the, the strong one, the one who goes uh, fast and well for the fermentation. That's a little bit more technical, but uh, it's very really interesting because we are now having a, a yeast from Le Crayer, and that's really cool. Uh, so uh, this is Le Crayer 2014, which is uh, what's uh, the, the matter about this vineyard is that the soil is very thin, so it, uh, the roots are already into the, the chalk, and that gives a lot of salinity, a lot of um, tension, natural tension. And um, this is what I'm looking for. You look at the barrels here, and uh, we have 350 barrels, and I am tasting all of these individually right now. And they are all uh, individuals. They are each different. That's uh, each a kid, each a. Uh, uh, and um, and what I want to say is that um, I don't really judge them. They are living their life. They will be part of the composition. They could go. One of them could go in the top champagne we produce for. Papillons, one of them could be in the Crayer, one of them could be in our entry level called Shaman. Uh, but still, all of them have a reason to be. All of them are a, a fruit of love, and, um, and um, I communicate with them a lot. So my winemaking will consist in doing near nothing, simply uh, listening to them. And silence has a lot to say. Silence is, is not nothing to hear. Silence is everything to happen to hear. And so they, they question me, and I question them. And I do the same with my, uh, with my vine. And they, this is the, the beauty, the beauty of it. And um, so in a few days now, I will choose where the barrels of Le Vermont you can see on the back goes, where the other one goes. Le Vermont is, uh, Paul was uh, talking about Le Vermont, it's in 1950, and uh, so it's a different soil. And we see nothing is fixed in advance, there is no recipe, they all have their chance, they are all kids, like, like we are. Um. And so this is uh, this is Shaman, if you can see it, uh, and the Korean. Perfect. Um, Benoit, I'm going to see very quickly. Um, I don't know, Christopher, are you able to bring uh, oh. Peter Ferreira up on on video? And unmute him quickly. Is it possible quickly? Sure thing. Um, Peter, I'm going to half put you on the spot here. I hope you've um, brushed your hair. <laughs> um, Benoit, I don't know if you've met uh, um, uh, Peter Ferreira before. I'm sure you guys have come across each other, I'm sure. Peter, are you no, there? No, but uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, loud and clear, loud and clear. Nice to have you, Peter. Fantastic. No, no, I, I've never had the opportunity to be, meet Benoit, but uh, when he speaks about these soils like that, uh, we have still so much to learn. So, uh, Ben will see me after lockdown. Okay. Okay. Well, Peter, I wanted to maybe um, 
uh, maybe you wanted to just ask one of those questions. Maybe not about the egg lying down one, but the other one. <laughs> yeah, I just uh, I can't remember what I've 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 posted one it, or two. Was, but... It was the one with the with about the reserve wine and the the. the oh yeah, 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 yeah. Benoit, yeah, I, I, it's most probably just uh, we can put it into one question. Uh, what is your philosophy on uh, the use of reserve wine? And if you do use reserve wine, because I, I know you sort of terroir driven, you try and do mostly vintage dated uh, champagnes. Uh, what is your take on uh, a reserve wine or then perpetual reserve if you use that? That's question number one. And um, the, the other one is just uh, how important seeing you uh, have very little dosage. How important do you see dosage in the final makeup of your champagne? Okay. Um, Thanks, Peter. Reserve wines are, so um, for the blends I'm, I'm going to now, we're talking of 19, 2019 harvest, and I'm going to choose between uh, 18 to 30% of reserve wine. I have no clue today of the amount I will be using. It's simply a matter of harmony. And this harmony cannot be designed for every year. This harmony is fluctuating from one year to another. Some houses are using 50% of reserve wine or even more. On my side, I prefer using much less because I think it's um, it, it, it gives too much power and it, it removes a little bit of finesse to the champagne. Uh, so uh, we have uh, two main non-vintage champagne, Chaman White, Chaman Rosé, and then the whole lineup is uh, only vintage. And the second question is about the dosage. I was, like every producer, quite feared quite scared of going down, but I came from far. My parents were adding a lot, like every producer in the 90s, and step by step, I decrease every year from one degree. It doesn't work as easily as that. Sometimes you remove one, one point of sugar and the almond is not here. So sometimes you better go down for five points of sugar to get something interesting. But you don't dare. You, you don't want to do it because in your mind, you think that it's going really too low for the customer. And at the end, too often we make wine thinking of the customer. And you have to let it go. You have to think for yourself. And uh, it's unbelievable, but what happened to the wine since 2010, where we were around 9 grams, it, it, it's beautiful. One of the wines was, was doing very well at 7 grams, so we went for it. And the year after, or 6 months after, all the other wines were looking for less, of something around 7 grams. So we went down every year this way. Then from seven, we moved down to five, then to three, then to two grams. And, and, I, and I said to myself, um, you know, when you, when you have a problem, you, when you have, a, unfortunately, your arms that is cut, uh, you got somebody else's arm and you try to recover the parts together and it doesn't work very well. And uh, when I was, in the, the more and more I was tasting the wine with sugar, the more I could feel there was a break in the energy. The more I could feel that it was imposing something to the origin. And uh, it was not necessarily a request from the wine. It was just about ourselves, our worry. And the wine by its own, without those actions, Without those that was really interesting. But all the time, we could be scared of the reaction of the customer. And one day, we let it go. One day, we say, this is right. We have to accept it. We have to leave. 
And uh, our customer will love it all. He's like, we don't mind. We think it's right. And uh, never, never a customer called me to say, wow, it's too dry. It's too, too acid. There's something wrong. It never happened. So every day, today in Champagne, I, I tell people, this is not a trend. This is really right. I'm not making champagne. Champagne is uh, with sugar. I'm making wine of champagne. And into a wine, after the bottle, you don't add something. So this is my case. And I help uh, other growers who wants to do the same, who are afraid of it. And I said to them, as we taste together, they go for it. And uh, it's, it, it, it's working. It's working. But we, we're, coming from, we're coming from Paris to Midiac because in 1700, that was 200 grams of sugar used. So that means something like half of the bottle was emptied as a disgorgement and replaced by a liqueur. And uh, step by step, we went down to, uh, to something around the 20, 15 grams after World War II when um, when there was a shortage of sugar and uh, and today it's uh, it's a new a new set now well benoit the 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 great thing is that um maybe some of those concerns from a consumer point of view with uh, let's say uh, no dosage and maybe no sulfur it's it's something that uh, people have shared with us um but I'm happy to say that every single bottle we drink has been a really, really pure, amazing expression of, of what you're trying to achieve. So, so far, so good. And um, it's, it's a, I think, an exciting path. And it's something, um, I mean, almost revolutionary in terms of, as you say, it must be really difficult to, to make decisions like that because uh, if it goes wrong, there's a big consequence and it's uh, to have a real firm belief in what you're doing. So um, I suppose from, from us, it's, uh, I think it's, it's amazing. So I, I think, thanks for answering uh, so honestly and it's great. Um, Benoit, I think um, I'm just looking at the time. We, I'm sure we'll have a bit of interaction as we go on. Yeah, carry on, carry on. Uh, just one thing. Uh, the champagne I was making together with my parents in 2000 um, may not be appreciated today. And the champagne I'm making, I am making today may not be enjoyed in those times. So as a whole, all of us, we are evolving towards a new, new, new living side, new energies, and we enjoy new wines. So we don't know what will be the future in 10 years, but probably the wine we will like in 10 or 20 years will have nothing to compare with the ones of today. But we have to accept. We have to accept um, mistakes. We have to accept things we don't understand today. We have to accept wines that are not talking to us today, because maybe in 10 years, we will love them. That's it. Nice one, Benoit. Thank you very much, man. That's fantastic. Um, I think, um, and I'm sure we'll, we'll have you back for some questions. And, and Benoit, please interrupt if you've got any questions when Paul's chatting. But I think the next slide is um, we, we're handing over to, to Paul. And I see that JP, JP, welcome. JP's joined us. Yeah, sitting next man. to Paul. I, I didn't think that Paul actually needed help to finish a magnum of champagne, but obviously I was wrong. <laughs> Um, but it's my, uh, my no, well, <laughs> finish the second one. If you're ready on the second one, <laughs> no, nice welcome. And yeah, Paul, I'll let you and um, and JP take it away there. Thanks, guys. Pleasure. Eh? Um, do you want an introduction on Como? Yeah, yeah. I think, um, for those who don't know Como, um, personally, I immigrated here, um from French-speaking Belgium almost 20 years ago. It was in 2002. And, you know, as a Belgian, we are, Benoit will tell you that actually the Belgium are the number one consumer of champagne in the world before the per capita. <laughs> it's well known in champagne. 
So um, I grew up in that culture of champagne, never thinking I would I was going to make any in a stage of my life. But moving here, you know, I got here and um, it was still the early days of Cap Classique, but I got very excited to see everything that was around. Um, but what, one thing you must remember where I lived in Belgium was just two hours away from um, the Champagne region. So it's a where we used to go very often on for the day or the weekend. And my memory of Champagne is exactly what Benoit described there. And, uh, it's the, the smaller producers. It's um, what South Africans don't know enough yet. It's, to, it's what makes really the Champagne spirit is all those distinctive characters from small producers having their distinctive style. It's not just a mass produced uh, Champagne. And coming here, I discovered some very interesting stuff, but also discovered there was not a single uh, winery in South Africa of commercial size that was uh, dedicated to the sole production of Cap Classic, where, again, Benoit will tell you in some villages in Champagne, literally every, in some villages, every second house is a family winery making only Champagne. Okay, that's how they are. So, and that's how Colman was born with a big, big push in the back from uh, Peter Ferreira uh, when we first met in 2003, um, who gave me the two thumbs up, but like a billion thumbs up to actually start like a small dedicated family uh, winery in South Africa to make exclusively Cap Classic with our distinctive style. This is how Colmont started, and that was the inspiration um, from Champagne. So nowadays, Colmont is making uh, around 60,000 bottles a year. That's where we stick uh, happily with our style. And now uh, it's been um, almost a year and a half that Paul has joined us, joined the team. And um, yeah, without being arrogant, the pretension is to be really be uh, recognized and established as a uh, number one boutique uh, cap classic producer in South Africa. So that's part of Mona. Good stuff. And then you wrote, uh, you got Paul to join, join JP, the team. Yeah, you know, it was a natural thing. Um, for the record, um, Paul's going to speak a bit about like, Paul um, is going to tell you about his story, but when he was still studying at um, uh, Anthology at Stellenbosch, his very first blending experience, he did it with um, Pete and myself here at Colmont. Um, still nowadays, the three of us are still blending every year together. Um, obviously, that's the exciting moment. So Paul has been like we, it's a long standing story with Paul and we just had to wait, the time was right to eventually work together. The beauty of Paul and myself, we are, um, well, as we call perfectly different, which means perfectly complementary in what we're doing um, and in achieving our goal of, um, of becoming that number one classic boutique in South Africa. So it's been a great journey. Um, together and I mean besides this is not just a business of winery um, we both live on the same farm also you know so it's it's way beyond just um, a business relationship so it's really cool like good stuff we don't live together at all in the same house eh? <laughs> <laughs> to make it clear <laughs> uh, good stuff now Paul do you want to um, yeah, I mean, you, you carry on, Paul. Yeah, um, thanks, yeah. It's fantastic to be part of to, today's presentation. But just quickly, I think my part of the story, as you know, it, um, I was just convinced my wife uh, to let me quit my job to make bubbly. Um, and it's my complete passion, infatuation. Um, yeah, it's a wine style that I love. And uh, the opportunity to work with uh, Jean-Philippe came across my path and we, we think the same ways about wine um, and about the style of wine we want to produce. But we, like, like Jean-Philippe said, we fill each other and maybe to ensure that we are going 
um, in, in the right direction. And, um, and we, we complement each other like that um, to, to keep the style honest in, in, in the way it's going. Um, and for us at the moment, it's really looking um, with a kind of terroir focus at, at, at what we want to achieve at Comar and making sure that where we are picking, we're picking the best grapes. But I think one of our big challenges, which might be quite unique to Benoit, is that we need to move grapes quite far from where the sale is. And it's about taking that quality that we have in in Robertson or the Himalayan or or um, in Bonneville and, and getting that uh, quality of berry back back to the cellar. Um, so I think that's one of the big challenges and we, we spend a lot of time working, working on that. Um, and then also just, you know, Peter asked about reserve wine and perpetual reserve. Uh, Jean-Philippe has always kept a perpetual reserve going. And now we look to you know, to focus in on that perpetual reserve and, and kind of hone it each year, looking for which components fit into that blend um, for us and, and for style going forward. I, I think really the philosophy behind Colmont, behind the style is really about blending. And one of the very, very strong components I'm fighting, and especially for Cap Classic with our specific condition, is to be recognized that non-vintage and reserve wine is the way to go for Cap Classic, which is something extremely difficult to get into people's mind, that reserve wine and even more for Cap Classic than for Champagne is a critical thing because people still believe that whatever is vintage must be better. And I think it's a completely a wrong assumption, especially with Cap Classic. And I will fight that to my last day with Paul, make sure that's the pride of Colmar proudly non-vintage, proudly, proudly consistent on, um, on the product and proudly consistent on um, um, uh, uh, having the best reserve wine always in stock to make the best products. Yeah. <laughs> I will not let that go. <laughs> uh, Paul, just thanks JP. Just a quick one on the production. Uh, without going on to a tangent, because we probably just want to, we'll get through the slides now. Um, what is, um, and then I'll, I'll ask the question to Benoit, because we didn't touch on the sort of, some of the differences between growers and the grand marks, just in terms of, let's say, the big guys versus the small guys, which I think Peter's mentioned in the, in the chat. What, what is Colmont's sort of production? And then after you've maybe answered that, maybe Benoit can just mention what his average annual production is, just to have, a, have an idea. Yeah, so our production is about uh, 60,000 bottles a year. But I think a, a key area, and, and it's something that we spend a lot of time refining and, and, you know, just even looking at our press programs from the last year and looking forward to next year, um, about phenolic extraction, that from the press cycles. It's about separating the cuvee, premier type, duzium type, and that's what, as a smaller producer, the bigger producers do it as well. But what, what uh, in our case, and, and specifically at Colmar, what, what it allows us to do is, uh, and also because Jean-Philippe and I are, are, are working on the process together, but I can spend my time at the press looking for, for that right um, opportunity to cut the cuvee from, from one portion to the next. And I think that... That is allowing us to, to keep the best of each component. And, you know, again, to credit Peter with this, Peter, Peter always says about the sun and the fruit in, in South Africa. I, I think it's something that makes uh, our Cup Classics unique is this kind of ripeness and that. And our challenge is to balance that ripeness and acidity. And I really feel that you can do that at the press. So we, we, we have standard models that we press according to. But, you know, for sometimes we cut the Chardonnay uh, cuvee fraction slightly earlier because we like the precision that we have there. And, and we, we give a little bit more to the premier type. Other times you have a bit more opulence. And so then, you know, then you can, you can stretch a little bit that cuvee fraction. So we, I think that's really important for us on, on a small level. And, yeah. And, and Benoit, what's, what is your 
current sort of annual production? Uh, right now, we're doing uh, 85,000 bottles a year, so we are pretty, pretty much the same. And uh, I, I, I think it's great to have small producers like you guys in, in South Africa. It's, it's great to share. Um, we, we have been uh, splitting the cuvee. We have been uh, dividing the, the juice in different parts for in the past. And for now nearly 10 years, I'm on, on my own, and this is not uh, something classic in Champagne. I, I have stopped doing this. I have stopped making champagne from uh, one part of the juice and the other part will be for other champagne. Uh, but I do uh, one, one single juice, which is, uh, which is uh, for me uh, the reflect of the whole dairy. And so it, it's interesting how uh, regions are, are totally different. But, and what I'm doing is, is, is not at all the, the common thing in champagne. Uh, but I feel that the tag, so the second juice, have, uh, has flavor and uh, they are full of antioxidants. And talking of, uh, of uh, low sulfite champagne, they are very interesting. Now, if I go for a winemaking with the cuvee on one side and the tie on the other, and then I decide to reblend them, it's too late. It doesn't work anymore. They have been divided. So uh, the benefit of it is lost. So we do one single wine from every, uh, every uh, plot. And uh, it's interesting because uh, for example, for Sapiens, our Prestige Cuvée, for Crayer, all of them, uh, we still get a lot of uh, a lot of finesse, and so um, and so I'm sure that the Thai are releasing a lot of finesse in our region as well. Thanks, Benoit. Cool, Paul. Yes. Back on. Cool. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I just wanted to ask uh, Benoit what his thought also was about the evolution of Cuvée compared to um, Thai components for them. You know, if they see different ageability or, yeah, in terms of the ripeness there. Okay. If you split the Cuvée and the Thai at the pressing, uh, the Thai. Uh, they, they're not going very well. They're, they are tough to, to do the winemaking with. Uh, if you keep them all together, they, they, are, the, they, are, the, they are giving the Cuban and the Thai together the best of each. And so um, for nearly 10 years, I, I have stopped splitting these. But before that, I was even splitting the Cuban in different parts and making champagne from different parts of the Cuban. And uh, it was interesting, but still at the end, there was something missing. So it was interesting on the analysis, on some sharpness, but at the end, I had to use some sugar. So my view was to, 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 to leave, to, to let the, the nature as it is, uh, that the berry is one, a unity, so the, the juice coming from the berry should be one. And, and, and so they, it brings things that the cuvee doesn't have. And at the end, uh, I get my, my style, my balance, the harmony. Uh, this way. Too often, too often ties are, uh, are not considered. And if we consider them as uh, Excellent juice. Um, in, in in my region, I think it's uh, it's really positive. Thanks, Benoit. Mm -hmm. So, Derek. Yeah, carry on, Paul. Cool. Yeah. So I think you know, obviously, for us. Um, with uh, ripeness and man managing acid acidity, I think it's quite a different uh, scenario for us in terms of that. But 
and then also looking at, at slightly older vineyards for the maturation that we're achieving there um, is, a, is a key for us. But one of kind of, let's say, a more unique South African uh, take on, on, on vineyards and sites is the diversity that we can have between Franchuk, Bonneville, Robertson, Himmel and Arda, um, Elgin. and Algen, and, and then the ageability of those vineyards in, in each of the re regions, which is, um, but I think it's the fantastic part about that is maybe it, it ties in nicely. It's uniquely African um, or, or South African, this, this kind of idea of diversity of, of, of numerous plots and yeah. What we can see on the on the picture is uh, Chardonnay. Uh, sorry. Uh, is, is it Chardonnay, one? Paul? Yeah, just one second. Yeah. Yeah. So these these are sorry. We had the um, group <laughs> chat. The questions open. Paying attention now. Um, no. So the that what we have is Chardonnay and and um. Like I was saying to you beforehand, I think what's important here is about getting the quality from the vineyard to the cellar. And so we use a slightly smaller picking crate than what's internationally used for less bruising of the berry. I think it's a, a riper skin in the South African context. You have slightly more easy um, phenolic extraction from the skin. And, and, and in trying to control that, we use a smaller picking crate less layers of bunches and, 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 and less opportunity for cooperation. And also making sure that we picked by, ideally on harvest time, by nine o'clock to, to control the temperature also, to, to, to control the, the opportunity for enzymes in the grape to, to extract from the skin. So it's about managing that process for us um, in the vineyard. You're returning the quality of the vineyard to the cellar. The, this particular shot obviously is in, in front of uh, Christine, you have the, the next shot of, yeah. So um, this is also, we, we included this, this um, all the vineyard for, uh, planted in 1988. So um, I think in, in view of some of the dates that have been given out today, not so old, but um, it's an older vineyard, but it's a fantastic example of Chardonnay on a, on a dry land, which is quite unique in terms of Chardonnay in South Africa. Um, and um, it's also here yeah, in Franschhoek, one of the, the, the old vineyards, one of the oldest Chardonnay vineyards in Franschhoek. And um, so it has a little bit of uh, leaf roll. So I think it's, you know, it, um, maybe its days are, are counted, but um, excellent, excellent ripening conditions. And even through the, the drought, um, we've, we've managed to, to get quality grapes from it. And always, interestingly enough, the, the balance of acidity and sugar in these grapes is, has always been good. So you have this kind of ripeness in the skin with, with still a good acidity. And, and I think, like we said earlier, the challenge in South Africa is, is to, to have uh, acidity to keep the, the freshness and the elegance in the wine, a nice tension in the wines. This is a sandy soil. Yes, it's quite a, it's a, it's a nice combination of a sand and clay. There's a, a relatively good amount of clay, um, but enough that you have good uh, um, uh, root, root pen penetration. So, sorry, just to come back. So this is a, a shot from the, the vineyards in Bonneville, just showing a little bit the, the shell. There's a, a bit of chalk. Well, not so much in this photo, but further up in the, in the picture on the right. But this is what's really unique about the site in Bonneville and, and what's really exciting about that site is this kind of um, tension that we, we pick up. Um, and so Bonneville and Robertson are, are not having such a, a big diurnal shift. So it, even though the midday temperature is quite high, the vineyard cools down really quickly. And in the morning, it takes quite a while for that, that kind of core berry temperature to heat up. And um, that's what's exciting about a specific block like this. So we, we're working really hard with this block and it's one of the producers also that's 
it's kind of going on a almost a minimalistic intervention in the vineyard to to preserve some of that unique character and the unique uh, biodiversity in the in the vineyards. Paul, how how important is the the age of your vineyards in terms of that? I suppose in complexity that you're looking to put in the bottle is it sort of slightly less relevant for you on on the bubble side of things versus let's say still wine or how do you how do you sort of see that? No, I mean age is in, age is in, in, important because uh, a good healthy vineyard is. Um, is probably going to deal with some of the peaks um, in ripening better than, than, than maybe say a younger vineyard. Um, but there, there, there is also an interesting phenomena in younger vineyards with kind of more consistency in the, in the berry. So uh, uh, up to a point. But for us firmly, that, you know, at Kumar, it's, it's about blending components. So sometimes we pick a, a particular clone in a particular site uh, for, for what it brings. And um, each brings a, a component to the whole to, to create complexity. Um, so, you know, that's how we would answer. And I think also, um, Jean-Philippe is going to say something now about that as well. But I think what's really important is we look for sites that inspire us. And, you know, we're always looking for new sites to, to develop and, and refine what we are doing. And we, we picked a site um, this year for the first time to together. To and I remember walking in the vineyard for the first time. I said to Jean-Philippe, I love the sense of expectation when you stand on a site. And you just feel like the, the vineyard is saying to you, it deserves uh, e everything that you can give it. And so... You know, you look at the slope, you look at the soil type, and, and you realize, okay, th this is something really special, and um, yeah, you're going to take good care of it. Yeah, I'd, li I'd like to add, it's fantastic what Paul's saying. Two things about aging. First, it's about diversity in the blending, like anything else, like different regions, different clones, different years, everything is the same. It's about diversity. Um, so it's important to, to, to work on the quite a range of ages. But the, the second thing that's in my mind is that if anything I want more age, it's definitely Chardonnay uh, than Pinot Noir. I, I trust more uh, younger Pinot Noirs, not young, young, but like I don't really trust as much old vines Pinot Noir where we've got fantastic old vines Chardonnay. Um, that's that's my, my take on aging. So I would rather go on edge with Chardonnay than Pinot Noir uh, here, where we are. I don't know if there was a situation in Champagne about um, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay aging. Um, Pinot Noir is, is, um, is what usually, does is when it comes to aging, do Champagne Noir look more at Chardonnay or Pinot Noir? Well, uh, the common belief is that Chardonnay has a better potential of aging. Uh, this is due to Champagne Salon, this is due to Claude Mail, possibly, but also of our cuvée, Comte de Champagne, and so on. But, 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 this was at a time, this was uh, from grapes coming from a period. Um, I have the chance to know very well different region and taste a lot of different Champagne. And also, I, uh, I propose champagne from other regions. And um, since uh, uh, about 10 years, I see a real potential rising in very fine Pinot Noir. Are they getting better? Are they developing better? Are they giving better with uh, global warming uh, compared to Chardonnay? I'm not sure. But I see the delicatesse of champagne to be expressed more and more in old Pinot Noir. I'm not really talking about clone. I'm a, I'm a little bit upset with clone. Uh, of course, I have 20% um, of the property being clone, uh, but I find them um, too linear, too 
similar. Uh, it, it lacks some spice, it lacks some energy. Although the local official technical people pretended uh, since the late 70s that it was the best of the best, today, uh, for 20 years now, I, I'm still not convinced. And, and I prefer uh, the variety of old Chardonnay, old Pinot Noir. Uh, and, and again, I, I see those days um, amazing Pinot Noir coming out with bigger potential um, than the Chardonnay. Uh, and it surprises me, and I think not everybody is aware of that yet. But it's the comeback of the Pinot Noir, in my opinion, in Champagne. <laughs> Thanks, Benoit. Paul, um, I was just looking, we're just trying to manage time, and I know that there's still, we, there's some people that have got to go and cook dinners and things like that, so we'll probably just do five more minutes, um, and, then, and then we'll probably close it off. So I don't know if, if there is another slide from Christine, but um, maybe if you can sort of broadly start to look That's to end good. off, and, we'll, and if there is another question on the, on the chat, I'll obviously just attack it. So yeah, thanks, thanks. Well, Derek, I think maybe also just to, to tie in a little bit with Ben what he's saying. Um, I, I think it's also about philosophy of a house and that's, that's great again in diversity and it's, and maybe just to come back to the whole thing about picking vineyards and it, and why it works, why, they, why there's a good overlap or a mesh for, for Jean-Philippe and I's uh, kind of shared philosophy. But I, I think it's important at a house or uh, at, at a producer that the, the day you walk into a vineyard, you already know where, where you are going. It, it's not going to be a smooth road, but you, you have a clear identity of who you are as a producer, what you are trying to achieve, uh, what you believe in. Um, and, and, and you see that in the grapes that you taste, you, you see that in the site that you pick. And I, I think this um, identity or this philosophy of what you are doing needs to be the backbone. You, you know, a great blend, there's always something that carries the wine across the palate. I think it's the same in a house. You have to have this backbone, this idea, this philosophy that pulls it all together. Everything I'm saying is, is, is about me, but um, uh, making wine is... Uh, um, something between man, uh, human, and, and, uh, and the plant. And uh, nothing can be uh, uh, happening. And the same cannot be happening everywhere. No, well, I think that's, that's the beauty of it, is you have all this, um, the, that's the diversity you get from different philosophies and different plots of land in different countries. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's awesome to compare. Um, and Paul, any, any parting shots there before we maybe as, as I thank Benoit and maybe close it off? Yeah, no, it was fantastic. And thanks for the opportunity, Benoit, to share ideas and to have a look uh, and, uh, and see something new. Is the heart for the, the magnum or for me? I, I'm not sure. <laughs> but yeah, um, I, I think that's what's great. And, then, uh, and again, maybe on the... Um, it's the opportunity to to look each day afresh at, at, at what you are doing and to evaluate it and yeah. Um, oh, well, that's that's well. Listen, Paul, it's been great to have you and JP um, and Benoit. Thank you very much. Um, it's uh, this is the closest that we've got to maybe having you in South Africa for for quite a few years. So. I think when we when when we're allowed to again, we're going to have to try and get you uh, to South Africa, and we'll put you in a room with all the winemakers, and we'll discuss all the different philosophies and champagnes and drink lots. Um, but no, thanks very much for you. Always very insightful, different, and uh, as I say, for me the the interesting thing is, is is you you really believe in what you're doing. And I think to have that conviction and it's all for the right reasons and we love drinking your champagnes and thanks for sharing all your thoughts with us today. 
And yeah, Paul and JP, thanks to you guys. Um, we look forward to many more occasions. And uh, for the moment, we've got to do it all virtually. And uh, hopefully we added some value to everyone that, uh, that tuned in tonight. And um, yeah, I've still got half a bottle here. So I'm, I'm going to be okay. I don't know about you guys. And um, Benoit, <laughs> ah, the Sapiens. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we, Benoit, we actually had, the, had a bottle of the 2008, um, maybe two weeks ago, um, just to take our minds off COVID-19 for the evening. And uh, the, wine was, the wine was incredible, really, really, really incredible. So thanks for that one. And yeah, thanks, guys. You must have a great evening. And thanks for joining us. Hopefully, we can get lots of you to the, to the next one. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thanks, Benoit. Thanks. Thanks. Sante. Sante. Thank you. Sante. Bye bye. Uh, thank you, Christine. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I love South Africa, and I will come back within the next year, within the next couple of years. Uh, last time was 2006. Beautiful memory. So uh, I look forward to coming back. Okay. Thanks, Benoit. Thank you.